All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> let's all open in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. This is the day, Lord, the day of your resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for your death, burial, and, re and resurrection, for paying for our sins, Father, and for sending back that comforter on us, Lord, to lead us and guide us into all the truth. And we pray your blessings in the services today here and for all the brides around the world. I want the minister's lips to speak and our ears to hear. Help us with the Sunday school lesson this morning. Not to be misunderstood, Lord, but you just help me to give this thought to the people in the way that you gave it to me, Father. And may it all be for your glory and honor. We pray bless all those traveling, all those who are not here today. Be with them, guide them in all they do and keep them safe. And we love you. We thank you. We give you all the praise for all your many blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> all right, so we're going to talk about uh, Come Let Us Reason. And I want to say right up front, uh, don't misunderstand me because I'm not saying that we, uh, I don't want to be misunderstood that we have to reason things to uh, make ourselves get revelation from God. We can't make God reveal things to us. I'm only talking about our part to do, okay? Our part is more than just sitting and waiting on things, sitting and waiting on a bus to pull up. Last time I talked about diligence, <clears throat> and I gave you all the, the keys about diligence, about how to become diligent, why we need diligence, because we're slothful, we're lazy. We're born lazy, and we're not just going to get things automatically. We have to do something, you know. We have to work our part, and God meets us halfway, you know. We talked about what diligence is and why it's important, and, uh, but I left off on this one ingredient, and it really didn't occur to me until afterward that I should have mentioned this, and this is very important. So, come let us reason. Part of being diligent in seeking the Lord is to set your mind on Him. Think on His Word. Hide it in your heart. Keep it always on your mind, and He will begin to reveal it to you. This is a vital aspect of the Christian journey. If we want to see God, we must look at Him. Let's turn our eyes upon Jesus, like the song says. Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me, because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. And uh, the scripture for this, where it comes out of the Bible, is in Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This is all about mankind falling, okay? or his high state that he was in the garden before the fall. And God reached his hand down from heaven to pick mankind back up. And he, he does it through reasoning and, and through lots of many avenues he comes into our lives and, and pulls man back up, okay, back to himself. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about your sin. Let's talk about your life and everything about you and who you are and why you're here and where you're going. So come let us read them. Okay, the word reason in the Hebrew lexicon means to prove, to decide, judge, rebuke, rebuke reprove, correct, to be right, uh, or be right. Alright, it means to decide. So think about what, uh, what we must do. We must decide. When we hear the word, we decide. Okay, it comes into the womb of our mind and we make a, a, a choice on it. We make a conscious decision about the word of God. To judge. Okay, because also the word... Some word we receive is false word. We also, the devil speaks to us and gives us false word. So we have to decide, to discern between the spirits, okay? To judge. To judge a point. To show to be right. To prove. To convince. Convict. To reprove. Chide. To correct. Rebuke. To be chastened. To reason. Reason together. To argue. Okay? So just, you know, work it out within your being. Decide on what, what you hear, and then you can make a conscious decision, okay? So our objective this lesson is to see what it means to reason about the word that we hear, and then to believe it. <clears throat> Another thing I forgot to say on that last slide, you notice it says uh, rebuke when you hear false word come in. That's where you cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 
So you rebuke, rebuke the false word that comes in. Okay? Alright. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention on the on the objective slide. Okay, Brother Branham sorts the scripture himself. You know when the angel of the Lord, I think, uh, would speak something to Brother Branham, even then he'd go back and try the scripture, right? He'd go test it and see if this is really of God. And God admired that. God liked that. He doesn't want us to just take over here and say, you know what, that sounds good. It must be right. No, you have to go try it. Reason it out. Uh, look at the scripture and see if it, it compares, okay? So that was our example, and we should do that too. First uh, John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, wherefore, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Okay, like what does Brother Dell always say? Compared to our new birth, right? When you hear anything at all, compared to your own new birth. All right, because Jesus Christ, if you're born again, He's come in the flesh. He's come in your flesh. Compare it to the word that you've received, to the new birth that you have, and see if it rings true. All right. <coughs> Satan wants to be God, right? That's been his whole goal. He wants to be instead of God. He wants to be worshipped as God. So he won't declare that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He, he'll, he'll point to himself every time. He'll always try to get you off the work, and he's very shrewd in how he does it. We have to be, you know, ready for that. Okay. Any questions so far? Just raise your hand if anybody has any questions as we go through this. I don't want to go too fast. I have a question. Uh -huh. You say um, we have to do things and God made, made us halfway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not. Yeah, maybe you can do a little ex more explanation. More explanation, okay. Well, just anything in life, I mean, when you want God to do something, you can't just say, God, do it and commit it to Him. A good example is my wife sitting there. Years ago, I had a long for a wife, and Brother Gary Atkins was a mentor to me. He came down, he, he, saw, he knew I was desiring a wife, he knew I was lonely, and he said, Brother Ryan, God will bring the right one in his time, but you can't just sit in your living room and wait on God to drop a wife for you down through the floor, <laughs> through the ceiling. She won't just pop down. You have to keep your eyes open. You have to look at it, but don't be dating. Don't be trying. You don't, there's no need to try one and try another and try this, try that. Just wait on God to bring it, but you have to keep your eyes open. See, that was my part. Be ready. Do everything on my part to be ready. Be a, you know, what I would think a, a good husband should be. Be ready to be that. Okay, be a good Christian. Be serving the Lord. And then his part was to bring me a wife in his time. And he, he vindicated it and showed me that she was the one. That's one example. Um, I mean, there's many examples. Uh, you know, basically, we are not called to just sit and wait on God to do everything. We have to study to show ourselves approved, like the Bible says. We have to keep seeking the Lord, Lord serving the Lord, walking in His Word, and, and He'll do the rest. There, there is a part, though, that we have. That's, that's what I'm saying. Does that make more sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So, there's nothing really in the Bible that we're supposed to just sit and wait on God to do everything. We, uh, we're, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to be patient, and then, uh, and then in the meantime, while we're waiting on God to fulfill what He said, we keep studying, keep praying, keep believing, believing unto until it's revealed. Then we're not believing unto anymore. It's a revelation. I didn't read this yet, did I? No. Okay. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Okay, there's that false doctrine again coming in. You know, Satan creeps in very small, unawares. A little saying will go forth, or something like that. And it's just very, very uh, subtle, okay, the way the devil comes in. But they'll increase. Those are seeds that the devil's planting. You know, little things. Little foxes spoil the vine. They start off as small little sayings. They increase unto more ungodliness. 
and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. Think about that, the seal, because we know about the mark of the beast, all right? The mark that started there in the garden with Eve. She took on the carnal mind. We'll get into more of that, but that's the carnal mind. It's enmity against God. That's the mark of the beast. It's, it's where you, uh, and, and the seal of God is just the opposite, you know, the ability to believe the Word of God. When you make a decision to believe the Word of God, you're going on with God, Okay, so then you have this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Do you see communion? The Lord knoweth them that are his, like Brother Bob's been talking about. You're in a communion, in a relationship with God. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Okay. So what are we? We are spiritual beings with the ability to reason and the ability to make free choice. Why? Now this is me talking. I mean, you may differ with this and tell me if you do, okay? I'm not right on everything. And I, I frankly, uh, I used to be really afraid to say what I believed because I was afraid that somebody would say, Ryan, you're wrong, and then I'd say, well, I must not be born again. But no, I'm not really afraid of that anymore. Now I'm thinking, let me say what I believe. If you find something wrong, show me because I want to be right. So show me if you see where I've maybe reasoned off the word because I want to know. All right? We are spiritual beings with the ability to reason and to make free choice. Why? This is what I'm saying. Because God needed to expand Himself into another form. He is ever expanding. You know, all of heaven cannot contain God. The heaven of heavens cannot contain God. He is ever expanding and becoming greater. Thus, He needed a form to expand into, created in His image and likeness. Okay? Um, where is that slide on here? Excuse me. All right, he's becoming greater, but not changing. Let me let me express that part. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, but he can move over into other forms. Still the same God, expressing himself in other forms, moving over to another and another form. Okay. Now we are beings with a soul. He can express in us his attributes. Furthermore, he desires to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. We were created to fulfill that. We have the ability to reason and to make a choice to accept and reject the truth. Okay. Is that pretty clear? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, all right. The carnal mind. Before the fall of man, Adam and Eve had pure minds. The carnal mind did not enter man until the fall. See, that's just again me saying because I don't believe that God gave His create His creations, perfect His perfect beings, a carnal mind. Okay. Because a carnal mind is to lust and it's to do all the wrong things. I believe he made them with pure minds, but with the ability to reason. See, God gave mankind the ability to reason and to make free choice. This again was to enable us to reason on the things of God and to be able to receive revelation or understanding of God like we do now, after the fall. Okay? So before the fall, it must have been, I presume it would be the same way, that man <coughs> received God. The Lord came down himself and communed with them in the garden and reason with them, and they could understand things about God. The obvious byproduct, which is a dirty word these days in the message, the byproduct or unintended consequence of this is that we can choose wrong, right? Because if you give man the ability to make right and wrong choices, at some point he could choose wrong or accept false word and reject the word of God. That is what the woman did in the garden. She accepted the lie from the devil and thus took on the carnal mind. You know, Brother Brennan went beyond the curtain of time. He said that he could hug the women and feel that they were really women, but there was no sensation or no, I think he was meaning, I assume he was meaning stimulation, all right? Because uh, there was no sex glands. There was no ability to go off in the wrong direction like that. So that being that way there, must have been that way in the garden because their eyes were veiled. They did not know they were naked. So Adam and Eve had pure minds and uh, really no ability to do the wrong things, the lust and things, until she accepted that idea from the devil, from Satan. Is that, is that all right? Okay. Now, 
like, like Paul said in Romans, I'm carnal, sold under sin. See, Eve sold us out, and Adam sold us out under sin, the carnal mind. So now we're all born with this carnal mind, this enmity against God. Okay, so Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the whole point of this, is proving the will of God. The word, His will is His word. Okay. Now this, to me, is how to get rid of the carnal mind. All right, Because we're born with it, we don't need it. We need to get rid of it. And how do we get rid of it? See, there it is right there again. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We take on the mind of Christ. Let this mind, this is Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being not in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death, death of the cross. So he walked in the will of God, the Word of God. He became obedient. All right? Obedience is better than sacrifice. So we're supposed to not be conformed to the world, be obedient to God. Killing this, or uh, doing away with this carnal nature that we've been given. And walking with God. Uh, John 8.32 says, "Truth, The truth shall make you free. You should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So again, reason. You study the Word of God. You, you uh, reason it out. You think about it. And then hide it in your heart, like David said. Hide, it, hide the Word in your heart. God will come and quicken it to you. He'll make it alive. Uh, John 16, 13. When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will lead you and guide you into all truth. That's actually supposed to be on the next slide. Excuse me. Brother Ryan, uh -huh. can you just give an example of obedience as opposed to greater than for sacrifice? What you said about obedience and sacrifice? Uh, <clears throat> let's see. I came, just came into my mind just then. Is that a quote of scripture? Let's see. That's a that's a quote, I think, right? Brother Brown. Obedience, obedience is better than sacrifice in the scripture. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. What would be an example of that? Well, what's an example of sacrifice in that reference of obedience? You know, I guess I would have to look up that scripture now because I might have taken out of context. But I'm thinking that uh, in the Old Testament they made sacrifices, all right, for sin, to cover it for a time. But what's even better than that is to come over here where you're born again. The perfect sacrifice has been made. His life comes and lives in you, God carrying out His own word in you and making you obedient. So rather than committing sin, you know, uh, iniquity, and going back and making the same sacrifice over and over again. Rather than that, why not come over and receive a new birth, and then it'll make you obedient, and that'll purge you from it. I don't know, that's just my speculation about that's it. That's right. good. I'd say that's right. Okay. You be obedient to God mm -hmm. after you're born again. Right, because... The sacrifice yeah. didn't do you any good, but being obedient to God will. Yeah, because the sacrifice became a stink in his nostril. Men, right. were, men were doing it for just uh, for routine, you know, for <coughs> tradition. Ryan, were mm -hmm. they sacrificing? Say, I never committed anything. Were they sacrificing? Did you need a sacrifice? Say that again now. If you never made a mistake, mm -hmm. did you need a sacrifice in the Old Testament? I wonder. Oh, everybody, everybody made mistakes. I mean, that, there was nobody in that in that uh, you know in that realm. They were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. The only thing is, they had to realize that they were in sin because. If anybody thought they didn't make a mistake, it was because the law hadn't manifested that to them yet. Because Paul said, you know, uh, I had not known sin lest it be by the law. So when the law came, that showed them that they were sinners. So they couldn't say anymore that I, I don't need to sacrifice. Everybody needed to for some reason or another. I thought maybe if you never made a mistake, say you were told not to kill, you didn't go kill, right. obey that, mm -hmm. you probably didn't need a sacrifice to kill them. Yeah. Even if, they, even if they hadn't murdered somebody physically, Jesus came and magnified the law. Now, you're talking about Old Testament. Yeah, I'm but, trying to see if that answers her. Because oh. if you, if I didn't kill, 
I didn't need to go make an offering. Mm -hmm. So if I obeyed the law not to kill you, mm -hmm. then I didn't need to go make any sacrifice that I killed anybody. Not for that specifically, maybe. Right. But up beside God, we're all filthy. Our righteousness is a filthy rag. So there's nothing that you wouldn't need some sacrifice for somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Even in the Old Testament, even before Jesus magnified the law, because he came and magnified it and said, if you even hate your brother without a cause, you've killed him. Or if you look at a woman who lusts after her, even without literally committing adultery, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. So everybody is has come short of the glory of God by a long ways. We are a long ways from Jesus. I had this guy uh, try to trap me or something. He said, you know, I'm going to kill you. We, if you're a true believer, if you're a Christian, do you sin? He tried to, Brother Brown said, we sin every day even if we just uh, don't ask your neighbor to go to church with you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, say, yeah, we sin every day as long as you're in this right here. Yeah, right. Exactly. So he knew the answer, but he was trying to see what I would say. Yeah. He thought you'd be self-righteous or something. Well, I mean, we're all in, Brother Brown said we stick it to the chains, so as long as we have the carnal nature, we're going to be right. doing things wrong. Um, I was just going to say, in the Old Testament, too, the Jews were commanded to have uh, feast days at certain periods of the year, mm -hmm. and they were always accompanied with sacrifices by that feast day. Right. So they were doing it as an ordinance, and not seeing the Right, okay, yeah. Exactly. It's just man's carnal nature because they still have the carnal mind, <clears throat> as we do, that we're still trying to battle with. And so we automatically lean to tradition and just doing things out of routine, forget why it's there, you know. So, I don't remember if I read this one. I don't know if you read the one no. prior to this. Okay, let me look. Yeah. You get to be my age, you forget things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did this one. this one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the revelation of Jesus Christ preached in 1960, 1204. Now, bless the word, the announcement of the blessing on the third person. To them that read or hear its mysteries, make, okay. The carnal mind shuns it because the carnal mind knows not a thing about it. No wonder the carnal mind doesn't know it because it's Satan in that carnal mind. And Satan is exposed. And Satan does not want himself exposed. And then he goes on to talk about Genesis and Revelation, how that Satan tries to hide those two books. He needs to be exposed. He's very subtle and wants to be hidden. He wants to do his work without being known. Okay. I've got to find myself in here. Hold on. Okay. This is the mind that took that Eve took on in the garden, okay? Satan in the carnal mind. Now Matthew eleven two And from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Y'all remember Brother Bob bringing this out a while back, maybe a year ago, I guess? And that scripture really struck something in me when he brought that out. I've never seen that like that, but uh, basically, it helps us to see that we are to fight against the carnal mind. This is not some, you know, lazy sit down and wait on God, like I said, wait on God to do everything. This is something that we're in a battle and we're fighting. And the kingdom of God suffers violence. We have to be a violent Christian, you know, daily walking and pushing and striving. Don't ever stop. Don't ever back down. And even if you fall, get right up and keep on fighting again. That's the point of that. So... Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Like in Ephesians, it's uh, Ephesians 6.11, the whole armor of God. Do you all remember the armor of God? Uh, the pajamas, the blanket, the pillow, the pacifier. Is that the armor of God? No, that would be if you're going to sit and grumble, like Brother Joe's been talking about, grumble, whine, and complain like a baby. No, the armor of God is warfare armor. It's armor that a soldier would wear to fight. So that 
gives you some sort of uh, you clue. The huh? You put on the work. Right, exactly. You got too many babies, that's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's a shield, a helmet, and a sword, and a breastplate. These are things that we're supposed to fight with. So we're not supposed to sit and just take it easy. We're violent Christians is what we're supposed to be. Like Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord. You know, he wouldn't let that angel go until he got a blessing. So we're supposed to wrestle with God. You know, and say, God, I want your word. I want the understanding of it. And I want the revelation. And just stay with God. And stay in the word. Alright, now, this is kind of juicy. It's off the subject a little bit. The subject is think on these things. This is what Brother Dell always talks about. At the end of almost every sermon, he says, think on these things. But I was just going to put that in here just for more support to my argument here, but then I saw something the other day within that scripture. I want to ask y'all if y'all see it. Just read that scripture. Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true, what sort of things are honest, what sort of things are just, what sort of things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Does anything shout out at y'all about that whole scripture? The things that he's mentioned in there? Anybody raise a hand? What's shouting out of that scripture? Uh huh. Anything? I, I think it's the word of God because whatever is true and honest and all that, it's. Exactly. It's, it's the word of God, but specifically. What do you say? This just occurred to me. You know, here's why, here's why I saw this. Because in a trial, the trial with Iva, here a while back, where she nearly died, okay, the first thing, one thing that I saw was that God manifested to me in is that He is perfect. He is perpetually perfect. I mean, perfect on top of perfect on top of perfect. In that trial, y'all remember I talked about fours and about deliverance and those things that I kept seeing that were evidence that God was there. Okay, I didn't directly see God appear to me in this trial. All I saw was that evidence that he was there. Like, you know, uh, what is it, Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it was evident that God was there because the things he did in the Bible, he was doing right in the middle of our trial. And the more I thought on it, the more I began to realize how much God was there. So I saw God as being perfect. So then I thought, well, you know, based on that, if he's perfect, then these must not be just a bunch of random things that Paul is mentioning here. Because I always thought this was just an optimistic scripture. Be optimistic, uh, positive thinking. Just think on some good things. Just find some good things and think about it. There's more to it than that. So I started studying into it and looking into what those are. That is the entire Christian journey in one verse. From start to finish. What sort of things are true? What happens first? You hear the word, right? You're introduced. Let's say you're not even a Christian at all. I'll just use me as an example. When I was a baby, I was born and raised in the Baptist church. Mom and dad took me to church. I heard the word. My grandma sat down and read Bible stories with me when I went to stay with her on the weekends and things. So, I received the truth. Alright? Wasn't even to the age of accountability yet, but the word of God was being planted in me in letter form. Okay? The truth. And then it caused me to be honest later on. I received accountability and I became to a point where the word was shining on the darkness in my life. Like I was telling you about. The word was shining on that darkness and showing that there's sin. You know, no matter how good I thought I was, there was sin there. So the light of the word shone on that and caused me to confess. For all sin comes short of the glory of God. So I was honest with God, honest with myself. Well, several things are just, pure, and lovely. Justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Spirit. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart. God is love. So what sort of things are lovely? God, you know, just pure and lovely. Think about your journey. Alright? And then, what sort of things are of good report? So what do you have after you're born again? The life, the life of God living through you. It's no longer I that lives now. It's Christ that liveth in me. So that will help make your life a good report. See? And then the testimonies, the trials, the sufferings, the things you go through, they overcame by the word of their testimony, the Bible says. We stand up there and testify. That's not some little thing. That's a big something. That's an overcoming and each of those overcomings show Christ to us. So it gives a good report in our life. Written epistles read of all men. A good report. If there be any virtue, stature of a perfect man. The virtues. What do you do after you get born again? Justification, sanctification, and baptism of the Holy Spirit puts you in the pyramid in faith, foundation. Then you start up the virtues. Alright? 
and if there be any praise. The whole point of this is for God to receive absolute praise in the life of obedient sons and daughters of God. So, the whole thing is the Christian journey. What is Paul saying? Finally, brethren, think on these things. Your whole Christian experience, where you've been, where you are, and where you're going. See, your whole entire life, think about it. Where God has brought you from, where He's bringing you to, and where you are now. <laughs> you know, I was thinking whenever they say, uh, let this mind be in you, I always look at the verses above that. He said, let nothing be done in vain glory, glory but in lowliness of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's just bringing the, what you're talking about, right. the Christian life. He said, let this mind be in you mm -hmm. to do what it says in verse 2 and 3. What's verse 2 and 3? Oh, well, yeah. it, it says, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord or one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on also on the things of others. And that just pulls all of that in. Exactly. Right. That's the mind he wants mm -hmm. us to have. Yeah, a lowly mind. <clears throat> not high-minded things like things that exalt yourself or exalt right. the devil. But the low things, all right? And uh, we're running fresh out of time. Let's see. Oh, that's just where I wrote that all out. All the things I just said, basically. I don't think we're going to finish. Um, let's see. Where am I in here? Okay. I'll see how far I can get. But this is just more expounding on the, that last verse. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. That's Psalm 8-2. So, have the mouth of babes and sucklings. So when you come here, you're a babe in Christ. And then he's perfected praise. And then Jesus went back and quoted that. This was David. This was Jesus. And here's thou what they say. And Jesus said to them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? Hast thou perfected praise? He wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And then more expounding on that same scripture. His love, this is just showing, okay? Perfect love casts out fear. Love and faith is the same thing. When you come to faith in the pyramid, you're coming to love, the love of God. Uh, love, perfect love casts out fear, which gives faith. You know, just in a baby form of faith. Baby form of, of the love of God. But there's more to be gotten. All right. What time do we normally stop exactly? 10.25 or 10.30? Yeah. 1025? Yeah. Yeah. More on this later. Y'all go upstairs. Any questions? <laughs> Part two. Part two.